All right, so yeah, tonight we're going, <laughs> this is our ninth class, so we have uh, only one class left after this, and it's going to be up to you all if you want a week off, or if you want a week of where we just get together in fellowship and maybe just uh, nerd up on apologetics before we uh, start the next class. Uh, if you all aren't familiar, we're going to be, uh, you're going to be finding out on Sunday, but we're going to be switching gears to our cultural apologetics class. I'm in the process of getting books ordered. This is what we're going to be op operating off of. So cultural apologetics is, in this terms, is going to be basically uh, dealing with the hot button topics in the culture of this day. So we're going to be dealing with stuff like um, critical race theory, intersectionality, queer theory, uh, excuse me, uh, all these other different uh, issues we're going to be running into out in the out in the world. So it's going to be, I imagine, a bit lively in discussion because they are uh, obviously controversial uh, subjects, but you all have seemed to be very resilient to the controversial topics. So I am going to jump right on into it. So let's see if this is okay. It's going to work. All right, break. No, I don't want to give something out. We'll try. All right, so ugh, sorry, my computer's suddenly deciding it wants to do a bunch of updating here. So all right, so this week is why are Christians so hypocritical? Um, interesting, I'm getting subtitles. Uh, <laughs> 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 that's how I get spotted. Well, writing down what you're saying. That was rather interesting. So, anyway, <laughs> all right, this is a fairly simple topic, but it's it's very very poignant. Uh, this is something you're going to get pushed back at you. In fact, uh, you all know my history. I spent many years as an atheist, and this is one of the biggest things that threw me away from seeking God's word more definitively was most of the people who I ran into lived a life that was so incongruent to what little I had already learned about the Bible. And this is something that can tarnish our witness, tarnish the church, which is tarnishing the bride of Christ. So this is in its utmost importance in dealing with this directly. So it seems simple, but it's also this simple little problem has a very profound implications and it has been addressed from time immemorial. So I'm going to kick right on in. So, uh, so are all Christians hypocrites? This is something is an ac accusation that's there's no more accusation more provocative than hypocrite. Unfortunately, some feel justified in their view that all Christians are hypocrites. The term hypocrite enjoys a rich heritage in the English language. The term comes to us via Latin, hypocrisies, meaning play-acting or pretense. Further back, the word occurs in both classical and New Testament Greek and has the very same idea, to play a part or to pretend. And I think that's uh, one of the things we... It's, Humans have an innate ability to detect is when people are putting on a false face, putting on a front, or that was the, the, the vernacular when I was, hey man, why are you fronting to me like that? And I never could quite figure that, what they meant by that, but uh, this is people who live out a persona, but yet harbor their beliefs, like typically in, in behind closed doors that are living a, a very simple life. And they're usually very open in the way that it bleeds out. But this is also the same way that the previous version of hip, <laughs> sorry, hypocrite is the way that Jesus employed the term. For example, when Christ taught the significance of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving for kingdom people, he discouraged us from following the examples of those who, who are hypocrites. As in Matthew 6, verse 2, Verse 5 and verse 16, by making public prayers, employing extreme measures to ensure others notice their fast and parading their gifts to the temple and to the poor, they reveal only an outward attachment to the Lord. And I, we see something similar happening in this day and age, and especially this uh, social media age. How many times are you out on Facebook, Instagram, whatever be your uh, social media of the choice, and you see somebody posting up that they're doing some sort of uh, uh, benevolence event. They're working at, uh, I, don't, I don't want to call out anything specific, but they're, they're, they're giving to the poor, or they're, they're dispensing meals out to those who are in need, or they're out and doing some missionary work. And uh, you see all these photos, but then when you're there with them, you just realize that they're 
not really engaged. I don't know, have you ever seen that? I call the certain levels of Christian missionary work is, is, is you know, Instagram and missionary work, you know, where people get to go out and have like some sort of a vacation where they feel pious and that they went out and served people in a, a third world country and then came back home and didn't ever present the gospel or in any way live out their faith towards those who they were serving. So, quite very hypocritical. I think that's what you're saying. It's like people who, who would rather go out and make these missionary trips to the rest of the world presenting the gospel, but not even going to help their neighbor, mm -hmm. being rude to the waiter at the local restaurant, uh, yeah. um, acting out to the to the people who are watching them out in the local grocery stores. Yeah, exactly that. It's basically cutting people off on their way to church as they're running a little bit late because they stayed up late the previous night. Not that I heard that. that What's that? <laughs> well, not recently. <laughs> Steve accuses me of that. I saw you that day and I had the smart man there. What's the smart man there? You know how many white suburbans are in this little town? A town. A town of a woman. Good. And then Steve says, I'll oh, tell you, you're going to. I am more laid back than that now. I used to at one time push everybody out of the way. Yeah, I'm in a hurry. Get out of the way. You just get so relaxed that foot just kind of settles further and further down on that exhilarator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just go wrong. <laughs> I, I'm guilty of that too. I've got that's one of the best things I have is a very uh, yeah. very beautiful wife who points that out to me when I'm doing it. Yeah. So, so this is a. Within these accusations, Jesus was uh, condemning uh, the Pharisees for performing well in this dramatic role of being pious, putting out this public example of virtue, of living some sort of religious virtue, but they fail miserably in the inner world of the heart where true virtue resides. Um, and his uh, very scathing condemnation of them I'll read out, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much of a child of hell as yourself. <laughs> Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whosoever swears by the altar, swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by who, he who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought, not, you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean out the outside of a cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean out the inside of the cup and the plate, so that the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not taken part with them in shedding the blood of these prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. 
Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that you that on so, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you have murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That's probably the longest diatribe scathing criticism of hypocrisy I've ever heard. And that comes from our Lord and Savior on the religious leaders of his times. So that begs the question is, how are we any different? Is this something that we inherently fall into as Christians? Is this something that is unique to Christianity? Or is this something more deep and part of the human condition? It's flesh. Oh, yes. <clears throat> When you say the flesh, that just means, you know, for uh, those who aren't familiar, because I know we got to remember the last hearing too, for one, flesh, for in the Christian terms, means the, the natural self, our material body, something that's separate from our spiritual self. But it's interesting that Jesus never calls his disciples hypocrites. That name was only given to misguided religious zealots. Rather, he called his own followers, babes, sheep, and his church. In addition, there was a warning in the New Testament about this sin of hypocrisy in 1 Peter 2, which Peter calls insincerity. But we have two blatant examples of, uh, I guess I didn't have a really good segue on here. I did a lot of editing, so there might be a little clunkiness. As I said, I uh, edited this uh, presentation after I got off work today. There's stuff I cut out and stuff I added in. So we have two really good examples of hypocrisy recorded in the Bible, uh, in the, in the post-resurrection uh, church, in Acts 5, 1 through 10, two disciples are exposed for pretending to be more generous than they were. This is Ananias and Sapphira. Does anybody remember what had happened to them and how that came about? They claimed they sold the land for less than they did, so they kept part of the money. Yeah, and that's trying to live outwardly uh, as righteous, sure. but, mm -hmm. but basically, uh, trying to be uh, materialistic and what's the word I'm looking for? It's to lose me right now. Just mm -hmm. trying to cheat God in essence. But uh, anybody want to answer what happened to them? They died. Yeah. yeah, God struck them down immediately. Did they not? Yeah. That uh, shows you. Yeah, the con the consequence was se severe, and we God despises hypocrisy probably the most about all sins. They're all based on good. But, mm, Please. All right. They, Ananias and Sapphira were Christian. Okay. Well, there's more. You're you're talking about Christian hypocrites, uh, and you and you even you you and, and in this slide, um, you compare Peter to Ananias and Sapphira. And, That's uh, so the. Well, you superior is charged with leading a group of hypocrites in the treatment of the Gentile believers. Well, Peter was a convert. Okay. And I inspire would never work. Okay. They were part of the group of believers. Mm -hmm. So they were part they, they may have been part of a group of believers, but you see how God treats God's we we yeah. learn we learn from if you take in the context the uh, the scriptures you're reading I'm saying. Uh, Romans, Ephesians, mm -hmm. um, here in Acts, okay. um, even with Apollos, whenever Apollos was okay. preaching, but Apollos was didn't have the whole story; he was ignorant. He was preaching a false gospel, okay. and I or uh, Priscilla and Aquila took a man, taught him, and then he went out and did right. Okay. Um, uh, you also have uh, uh, examples of Alexander, Hymenaeus, Demas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Alexander the Coppersmith. Yeah. So, um, people that people that were some of which now I don't know about Demas and and Hymenaeus, but 
definitely Alexander the Coppersmith was never a convert. Okay. And so, uh, so in that case, God deals with them much harsher than what He deals with okay. His His sheep. Right. I don't don't disagree with you on any of all that. In fact, I agree with you 100. percent But what I'm going to try through this presentation is getting you from all these people whom you name and saying they were never saved or they're never Christian. To bridge that gap. So that's one big old non sequitur in there. I don't understand the non sequitur. The... Meaning it doesn't it doesn't lead to your your argument. Not saying that, that it's not true, but your mm -hmm. the way you're stating it doesn't lead to that they're not Christian. We know them as uh, people who know the Bible know them as either uh, apostates or uh, false teachers, false prophets, but are having ergo not Christians. But I want to get you to the point where you can say, okay, these are people who are examples of not true Christians, or hypocrites, as you would say, and then how are they then judged as not Christians? Well, so I guess what I'm trying to get is, uh, how are you, uh, and, and help me, uh, so how are you, like with Simon the Sorcerer or Judas, mm -hmm. um, how would you, uh, I would say that like someone's going to me and be like, uh, this uh, Joel Osteen is a hypocrite. Okay. He's a Christian hypocrite. Why should I believe in Christianity? Uh, and I'm just, I know you don't like when I throw out names, but I'm just as an example. Yeah. So, so like, uh, I don't mind you I, throwing out names as long as you also say like their name and this is what they believe in, because otherwise you're just giving a name and it, it doesn't teaching a uh, teaching a prosperity gospel where yeah. he doesn't even believe that that Christ is the only way to heaven. Yes. So, um, Joel Osteen being like that would not be a Christian. Okay. He might proclaim to be one. Okay. And he, he's definitely a hypocrite, but he wouldn't be a Christian hypocrite. Okay. So, I mean, uh, as far as, like, trying to find evidence of an actual Christian who's a hypocrite. Okay. Um, well, we definitely go through that, bridging that gap that we're talking about. Uh, right now, uh, the main thing you can say is there is no such thing as a, what I'm going to build to is there's no such thing as a non-hypocritical Christian. Okay, I would agree with that. Okay, yeah. so yeah, but then saying somebody's a hypocrite and then somebody's a Christian hypocrite, you can delineate them. Yeah, but there's going to be there is actually a, a very good reason that we can build for somebody being a Christian hypocrite and somebody being a non-Christian hypocrite. Uh, so, so I guess my, so are you taking this from the? Because I'm not. I, this is my disconnect. I'm not understanding. Okay, are you taking it from the the aspect that people? Look at Ananias and Sapphira as though they were Christian, saying that they're hypocrites. Basically, yes, yeah. So people who live outwardly one way, but whose actual behavior or intent of their heart is completely different. You know, you can have some, as we talked about, people like Joel Osteen, or people even in our own churches who outwardly they sing all the they sing all the praise and worship songs. They're here every Sunday. They're volunteering in most of the events. But if their heart's not steered towards God, if they're not doing it in humble servitude towards God, yeah, they're not Christians. But how then do we know that? That's going to be the hard part. And That's when you look out for the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Indeed. There's people out there that are so good to be able to, to imitate all of that. Yeah. And in the final analysis, when we stop and think, how can we affect our affair? I don't know which word is appropriate. Their livelihood or their lives so that they can correct their direction from saying an unchristian, even a Christian, mm -hmm. even a Christian that's mm -hmm. being a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. How can we affect their lives so that? We can steer them in the right direction. Yeah. And I think in that lies our Christianity. In that lies our, uh, what I want to say, our testimony. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In life. If, if by my example, if by our servitude, someone is not. <clears throat> Following, or someone is not correcting themselves, then we're failing. Mm -hmm. We're failing, and I'm going to go so far as to say that 
a lot of the ills that a lot of Christian people put on the world are our own doing. I agree. Yeah. We have dropped the ball. I have constantly said, I was there in 75, in the early 70s, and I didn't hear half. I didn't hear one-fourth of what I hear now about abortion. Where were they? I was there. I heard all this. I was a kid, but I remember. And I'm saying, we got the ball. We did. We got yeah. the ball all along through the ages because we didn't speak up, we didn't stand up, and even today, we want to blame the state, we want to blame the government, we blame the world, we want to blame the laws. It is our responsibility. God has given us that responsibility as his followers, as his church. And we want to pass laws, we want to make mandates. And what's the greatest commandment? What did Jesus tell us? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and body, and to love your neighbors yourself. Yes. So you think, at that ahead. point, I'm sorry, but at that point, you realize what our mission is. Mm -hmm. She's had a minute ago. You have so many people that want to go work out there and do it and then come back and crack themselves in there, but I think that's good. Yeah. But they're right next door, you got people that are screaming at you. And we don't help them. I got a quick question to ask. Yeah. Who is the bigger hypocrite? The, the Christian that's not living a Christian life? Or the Christian that says they're living a Christian life, but are afraid to call it hypocrisy, those who go against God? Precisely. The, 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 let's say, my daddy always used to say, watch out when you point. Mm -hmm. got three you got three fingers pointing right now. Yeah. And when we point at someone else, yeah, right. it's correct, it's right, it's true, it's uh, probably uh, can be upheld in a court of law. But how much do you benefit, or better yet, how much do they benefit by you pointing at? As opposed to, come here, let me show you what we need to do. Okay. Come here. Forgive me because the last time I spoke, you weren't listening to me, but because I misspoke. Let's correct that. Let's start over. Okay. What I'm saying is that of all the time that Jesus was in, in this earth, he only turned the tables and threw uh, people out of the sanctuary and all this kind of stuff. One time. What did he spend the rest of his life doing? Preaching re repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand, yes. And healing and helping. and I mean, we get a lot more done and we accomplish a lot more with, uh, with good actions as opposed to uh, contradictory or uh, I don't know, just babbling, saying things yeah. that don't really matter in the final outcome of things. You might have something there, but who's going to listen? Well, there's a set, well, one of the things I'd say is the church is horrible, absolutely horrible in, in promoting a strong Christian ethic. To actually delineate what that is. We have a lot of life application work that's put out there that's basically uh, Christian self-help, for lack of a better term, but there's nothing out there, <laughs> nobody, well, there are people, there are not enough people out there promoting what a truly Christian ethical life should be like. So, without having this standard to hold to, what do people do? They take the lines of scripture, you are talking about that, that pointing, that's just a, an interesting analogy, but it can also point back to the the, uh, the speck in the plank. Anytime you criticize or try to rebuke a fellow Christian, that's the first thing they pop out and mind, you look at the plank in your eye. Uh, but what I'm going to try to tie this all into is 
the different ethical systems that people follow, they used to try to uh, distort the Christian witness into making it play out for their own gains. And that's ultimately what hypocrisy is, is to gain a moral system. Mm -hmm. You know, distort it. You know, did God really say? Yeah. The first and original sin emanated from that. And however we handle our benevolence, our loving our neighbor, can be handled in both the ways of giving them the cool glass of water, giving them the food when they're in need, but it can also mean rebuking them when they're steering away towards sin and condemning themselves. So that's something we do have to look at is the, the love and the rebuke. That benevolence and the rebuke is the same side of both, let's say, a love coin. Mm -hmm. And just as God's love is equal to his wrath. Yeah. So. <clears throat> All right, so still talking about uh, are all Christians hypocrites? So we all, we're all in agreement in this room. Yes, that's the answer. So from the New Testament, we draw two conclusions. First, hypocrites do exist among professions, professing Christians. In fact, they are all of us. They were present in the beginning, and according to Jesus' parable of the tares and the wheat, they will certainly exist in the end of the age. In addition, even if an apostle may be guilty of hypocr hypocrisy, there is no reason to believe ordinary Christians will be free from it. We must always be on our guard so that we do not fall into the very same temptations as promoted in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. But, of course, not everyone who claims to be a Christian is truly a Christian, as we were talking about, Farrell. Perhaps all or most of the famous hypocrites among Christians were, in fact, pretenders and deceivers. To this day, prominent Christian leaders have fallen into terrible sins. Financial and sexual scandals sometimes seem to plague the Christian community. However, instead of taking the actions of a few and using them to denigrate the whole community of Christians, we need to ask whether all those who claim to be Christians really are. And this is something you're going to run into doing uh, apologetics. Most of the pop atheists are going to throw out like little snips and jokes about uh, molesting kids. Unfortunately, there has been a huge amount of sexual scandals within the church. Um, and unfortunately, within the last five years, that hit the SBC horribly, especially in this area of the state, too. So it's something that we are still having to deal with out there in the public every day. But it's something we have to ask, you know, is this, is this due to um, Christians not being Christians? There's... Yeah, I would say. I, I couldn't see anybody who would claim to be a follower of Christ wanting to to use another image bearer of God for their own personal gratification. That's something that goes beyond the pale. That is about the opposite of love that one can ever get. But also, one of the big facts that I think the church failed on is that wherever there's sheep, that's where the wolves go. And unfortunately, we did not have our eyes open for wolves and sheep's clothing. We were, and still are, too, too naive to be critical of those who proclaim to be Christians. We, we have almost this naive understanding once we dunk them in the baptistry that they're completely regenerated uh, and they're, they're absolutely... Could you say that again, too naive? Too naive to think that once we dunk somebody in the baptistry that they have all of their sins are, are just gone or that there was even a, a true profession of faith if you will but that, that they've been completely regenerated at that point to where they were they would be able to handle and be trusted with not sinning especially those who have suffered from uh sexual sins and then we let them loose because all churches we all need our volunteers we're in dire need of volunteers we know that we got bbs coming in a few weeks and I'm probably going to volunteer, even though I barely have any free time, but I know the church needs it. But that's how it is. We, like, oh, you want to volunteer? Come on. And then we're also wanting to be able to encourage everybody to take part of the church, and we don't look out for the wolves. And as a matter of fact, we've absorbed so much of this culture of judge not lest ye be judged. It's a horrible, horrible exegesis of that, that line of scripture, yes. that we are afraid to 
completely vet somebody and then we, we give them access to the most vulnerable of us. Mm -hmm. And then we even more naively allow people to get into situations we don't, we don't promote accountability at a point within the church. And I know just recently everybody was making fun of um, Vice President uh, Pence because he wouldn't go out with a woman that's go out to dinner with a, a, a co-worker that's not his wife. But that's standard Christian practice is to avoid improprietous behavior, even accusations. You just don't put yourself in those kind of positions. But unfortunately, we've opened our doors up to allow just for that. So it's something we have to live down, something we have to contend with. And I'm going to just warn you, anytime you're not talking to atheists out there, they're going to throw that in your face. Even non-atheists, just people that's going to generally... So, back on track. So, numerous biblical passages confirm that those who truly belong to Christ will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus' parable of the seed in the soils in Matthew 13 makes it clear that not all professions of faith in him are genuine. Sadly, many who profess to belong to him will be stunned one day to hear him say, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And those people who came up, we did all these deeds in your name. Second, while it should not surprise us that people who pretend to be more holy than they are claim to be Christians, we cannot conclude that the church is made up almost entirely of hypocrites. One surely may concede that all of us who name the name of Jesus Christ remain sinners even after our sin is forgiven. That is, even though we are saved from sin's eternal penalty, we are yet to be saved and delivered from the presence of sin in our lives, including this sin and hypocrisy. Though our living faith in the Lord Jesus, we continually overcome sin's power until we are finally delivered. <clears throat> Though all Christians fail to perfectly live up to the standards the Bible teaches, no Christian has ever been perfectly Christ-like. However, there are many Christians who are genuinely seeking to live the Christian life and are relying more on the Holy Spirit to convict, change, and empower them. There have been multitudes of Christians who have lived their lives free from scandal. No Christian is perfect, but making a mistake and failing to reach perfection in this life is not the same thing as being a hypocrite. So the word of hypocrisy is often misused, or rather, and precisely used, too often, a hypocrite is someone who does not live up to the standard they profess, but this seems insufficient. No person adheres perfectly to their moral, moral code. We are all sinners in need of the mercy and grace of God. If the definition of hypocrite includes everyone and doesn't describe some constitutive attribute of human nature, then it's not particularly useful. In other words, uh, that's kind of a way of saying if we're all hypocrites, is that word even really needed because it's just you can just basically sub, you know, substitute it with human. Yeah. But if we add another element to the definition, things become clear. A hypocrite is not simply one who says, do as I say and not as I do. A hypocrite is someone who says, it's fine for me to do this, but it's forbidden for you. you know, rules for thee, but not for me. Hypocrites hold other people to a different standard than that to which they hold themselves. It's not a matter of falling short of your rule, it's a matter of having a different set of rules for others than for yourself. At the root of hypocrisy is the desire for power over others. Hypocrites wish to enforce a rubric on everyone else while remaining unencumbered by it themselves. Mm -hmm. Hypocrites tend to use the non-inclusive plural in other words when they say we. They mean all of you, but not me. So, da, 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 da. I think this is one I was going to cut, but it's still in there. Yeah, Hypocrisy in the modern world. Okay, so, I cut out a huge chunk because I was getting into some, let's say, ethical, nerdy ethical stuff that really didn't have a lot of bearing on what we're going to be dealing with in the world. But what I wanted to do was, this is an interesting argument, I call it the hypocrisy of moral relativism. So, moral relativism is the predominant uh, ethical system out there in the world these days. It's the, it's what's true for, you know, that's not, I'm saying it horrible, my, my, my professor actually has a book titled this, I'm forgetting it. it. That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. I think we've all heard this, or, I live my truth, you live your truth, things of that nature. 
And it's basically a form of moral subjective, subjectivism, which means that we all have our own unique moral code, whether within a culture or uh, individually. So, so to call someone a hypocrite, this is the hypocrisy hypo hypo moral relativism, to call someone a hypocrite would be to claim that they do not live up to their own moral standard. This presents a unique dilemma in the modern age. The modern world mostly holds to some form of moral relativism, the ethical system that claims that moral standards are only true to the person or to the group they represent. This is the true for you, but not for me, philosophy that drives the postmodern ethic. The dilemma that occurs when the moral relativist calls the Christian hypocrite would result in the moral relativist either stating that the Christian is merely breaking their own moral standard, assuming, in other words, assuming that Christians are moral relativists, or they are affirming that Christians do not live up to the moral standards of God, this would then lead to the moral relativist promoting moral realism, which would be a denial of their own moral system. Do you want to, you want me to parse that out a little bit more? Seems kind of confusing. All right. So, Christians, we are moral realists. We believe that moral codes and standards are real. And we believe that they reside and emanate from God. So this is not something that's within us. We have we don't have our own truth. Truth is God. Truth is in the world because God created the world. So the issue with somebody saying, like somebody who holds the that's true for you, but not for me, kind of code, saying that the Christian is a hypocrite, would be stating either that the Christian is only only breaking their own truth which means saying they're a moral relativist too, or assuming that the Christian is failing these moral standards, meaning there are real moral standards in the world, but you can't have both. In other words, you're like, oh, you're not living up to your own real moral standards, or you are breaking your own subjective moral standards. You kind of understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're either saying, hey, you're not living up to your moral subjectivism when they're calling you hypocrite, which then, that's for us, like, we're not all subjectivists, we're, if this is something I'm talking about that you had asked me earlier, we're going to work towards, or they're going to have to hold up moral realism, which goes against their own belief, it's like, so if you are, it, it becomes paradoxical, like saying, uh, um, I, I believe in, I'm trying to think, I can never think of good examples on the spot, but uh, it's like saying, I believe in God, and I don't believe in God at the same time. If you kind of understand what I mean. So they're saying, I believe in moral realism, but I believe in moral subjectivism at the same time. So, moving on. I think a lot of moral subjectivists believe that the ultimate moral source uh, or moral standard is to live up to your own morals. Right? Exactly. Um, so, for you to say... Like the only true moral is to follow your conscience, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which a lot of people could argue that the conscience is the Holy Spirit, and I don't know how I feel about that. Um, so they're saying you're not living up to what your system believes, therefore, you should either system or get yourself together. Yeah, that's something you parse out in the in the conversation, but uh, that's something you would have to uh, parse out from the person who's accusing you of being a hypocrite. Like saying, okay, are you saying I'm a hypocrite because I don't follow my own subjective moral <laughs> standard, or are you saying I'm a hypocrite because I don't follow God's true objective moral standard? Okay, so you have to pick one of the two. You can't have both. So if they're saying that you're failing, uh, you're not living up to your own personal moral standard. Meaning you're a Christian. You only feel like you only are, you're only a Christian because you're raised in a Christian country. Your parents took you to church, and you internally believe in this God concept that I don't believe in. So I'm basically saying that you're a moral subjectivist by calling, which you can't be. And this is something I want to build into the argument down later, uh, or. They have to say, oh, you're not holding up to your objective moral standards. And once they say that, you're like, okay, are you going to affirm objective moral standards? Because if not, you collapse right back down into the 
this objectivism. You see what I'm saying? It's like you're, the, the line of arguments is we're trying to get them to go down a certain path. So they're trying, like, ha you're not, you're not following your objective moral standards. Where you can't go hold objective morals, so you can't even argue that. So we're back on this objective path. So and this is where I'm going to continue with the argument. So and Thomas, yes. I think this. I don't know if it's an example of that, but I think it's a way that Christians definitely show hypocrisy. You know, in the Bible, Jesus, you know, it says flee sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that Christians have a scale mm -hmm. of what they consider sexual immorality. So it might be that if, if you went up to Christian friends and said, you know, one of my children is gay or lesbian, that mm -hmm. used to be. <gasps> but now if their children are living together with someone before they're married, mm -hmm. that's not to them as big of an issue as what maybe you just confided to them. Because answers will come back of like, oh, well, you know how it is. They mm -hmm. just tend to live together before they get married. And they gloss over that. Mm -hmm. But there's there's no scale. Yeah, I would say it's, like, it's just standard hypocrisy. It's not really so much that, a, a scale. It, it, as, but I'm saying there is no scale. No, there isn't, yeah. There isn't, but yet Christians tend to soften the fact that their college-age kids are living with somebody before they get married. It's just this is what the kids do. And they see that if someone's children are homosexual, that, oh, well, at least my kids aren't doing that. Well, yeah. You know, the whole thing is, is it's all sexual immorality. Yeah. So to me, that's very hypocritical yeah. because instead of just saying it's flee, you flee sexual immorality, and you don't make you don't make excuses or exceptions for that. And and I think that's a very slippery slope that a lot of Christians. Are our own, and, you know. And if somebody that is not a Christian calls you out on that, that's something that you really need to that we really need to look at. Funny thing, you bring up slippery slope. No, I think way back in the first class, I think I got, went over it saying that not all uh, these things that they, the people will point out to you as being like cognitive biases are uh, not something you can use. So the slippery slippery slope argument. So take us back like hundred years. Oh, you were you had a you had a baby that was born in six months. Wow, you must must have been something going on before that, that marriage. You guys are sinners. And then it becomes, uh, oh wow, you were living together before you got married. Oh wow. And then it becomes, oh wow, you you had a kid out of wedlock. You were together twenty years and never got married. And now your kids are homosexual. Now your kids are trans, and you see the the continuation. And what it all is something that I've noticed is over the generations of Christians is the rules for thee, but not for me. Uh, oh, if this is with my kids, I'm gonna I'm gonna allot a dispensation for them. But your kids are horrible, and my kids are perfect. Mm -hmm. And that ha is how we have have led towards this normalization of sin in society because we are afraid to condemn those we love and hold the closest in fear of pushing them out of our lives. And then we've had yeah, so much normalization. Yes. I was going to say is that that was an issue in the first century and second century, big, a huge problem with the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that they would, the uh -huh. they were, let you go by and tell, yes, Jesus is the son of God. Now we have to go by the law. Basically. Yeah. You still have to, you still have to adhere to the law, but Jesus is God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, which, which was a contradiction. Yeah, well, and that's something we're going to get into a little bit further down is the concept of different ethical systems that we run into uh, that lead up to a lot of this these issues. So I want to not get derailed because this is a kind of a complicated argument once you well, learn. We just need to be, as Christians, make sure that you talk about a worldview. Uh, is, is that with our kids, and you know, our, we're going to fail with our kids, our kids are going to fail. But at least to try and do your best with raising your kids and, mm -hmm. and living your life to where 
what you're teaching your kids, how you're discipling them, whether it's a youth group or it's your own children, discipling in, in the way that Scripture says live your life. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's the, the, you know, it talks about that that is something that's going to come back and, and hurt that body. So are you saying that hypocrisy kills the... the, the no, what I'm saying is like the sexual immorality, you know, it's a, in the scripture it says that's what, you know, that comes in, you're harming your own body. Yes, it and does. So, well, so, it's also homosexuality. Well, we're, we're getting off the hypocrisy track yeah. here. But, so but I, I still, want to that's hypocrisy. One of the, it is, it is. And, and is we, as a professor of mine used to say one time, it's, it's that we not only shoot ourselves in the foot, but we pick the toe to start with. Because... We allow our pet sins to go unrecognized as sins, and they become our pet sins. And then we become, that leads us to being a hypocrite, because what we have said is, I know better than God. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. like Eve, is that I'm going to let my pride stand in the way, and I'm going to say, oh, well, this is okay because we live in this century. Yes. Yes. Well, I, would say, I want to get it back on track because I want to get us back to this. We can talk, we can follow up on that. But it touched into the fact that hypocrisy is probably the most destructive thing to, to discipleship that there is. You know, we can't have anybody follow somebody who won't follow their own example. You know, we'd be following Jesus if he went out and sinned. Oh, God, no. We wouldn't be. But uh, I, I do want to touch base into that. But there's, there's a little bit more involved than than just this slippery slope because it's just that snowball effect that we have of generational sin. So I want to get back to this argument because once you all learn this argument, this is something potent that you can use. So remember the dilemma is a person either that accuses you, accuses a Christian of being a hypocrite, either is trying to say that the, the Christian is not following their own subjective moral standards or is trying to say that the Christian doesn't follow an objective moral standard. So this is important, the dilemma is important in that if the relativist claims that Christian hypocrites are relativists, then Christians, spear quote, would not be adhering to God's real moral standard, thus making them non-Christian, and thus proving our point. In other words, if they're calling a Christian hypocrite, and you're trying to say they're not Christians, yeah, but great, you just proved our point, thanks. And then, or otherwise, to claim that a Christian does not form, follow moral, moral realism, that moral facts are real and not subjective, they would be confirming our moral realism. So in other words, there can be no such thing as Christian hypocrisy, Christian hypocrisy for moral relativists, only Christians living their own truth. Moreover, the moral relativists would be hypocritical to deny that someone is not living up to their own personal standards, the only way a person can be a hypocrite is live is to live to a moral standard. So basically, a moral relativist, something people out in the modern world, if they call you a hypocrite, they are being hypocritical to their own moral system. The moment they open their mouth before they get that second letter out, they're demonstrating their hypocrisy and they're also, or they are confirming our Christian moral standards and thus confirming our arguments. Either that person's not really, I mean, you're calling it a hypocrite, either not really a Christian, or you have to confirm that there is an objective moral standard. Otherwise, if they're only living their own truth, how can they be a hypocrite? That's their own truth. You can't be hip hypocritical when you make up your own truth. You make up the rules of the game. That moral relativism is grounded, uh, this is, we're talking about ethical systems, Moral relativism is grounded in the predominant meta-ethical system of the modern world. Utilitarianism is a branch of utilitarianism is a branch of consequentialism, which states that moral ends justify the means. So, anytime you hear people like trying to make a moral claim that, well, how it ended up, it ended up well, so that meant that everything we had to go through to get to that makes it good. But also, uh, utilitarian adheres to the premise that actions that produce the most moral good are the best moral actions. And you're going to get that from people out in the world is uh, that which produces the most human flourishing, that which produces the most um, benefits for the, the, the greatest group, something of that nature. Um, does anybody want me to, to spell this out a little bit more? I, mean, I don't mean to be condescending with saying that, but it's like Hollywood. What? It's like Hollywood. How so? 
Like every, well, every every movie you see out there where the where the good guy wins, well, yeah. you know we we killed all these people, we did all these horrible things, but <laughs> the good the, the good the guys won. So yeah. all's well that ends well. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, you know. So. Yeah. So these that's the predominant. This these are the predominant moral systems in the world right now. Just completely against Christian moral systems. That's also you see that a lot in other religions as well. Yeah, you will. You will. Um, so, the problem is that these actions can only be judged as good after the fact, and as such, one can endlessly justify their goodness after the deed is done. This is the same as making the rules for a game after the game has been played, and how do you determine the winner, and could the game ever be fair? So, this is the, the big pushback you have against moral relativists, is, so... Yeah, that's the end. But are you guys getting the the, the argument how that that dilemma works? Or do you want to draw? I could probably do a, like a flow uh, a flow chart. I wish I would have had the time. I was typing this up like right before I threw the laptop in my backpack to head over here. But does anybody have a question on how that works? Or does it seem like a, a valid argument to you all that you can use? Like saying, hey, "Oh, you call us a hypocrite." Thank you for proving my point. You know, you're either saying that this person over here is not a Christian. Or you're saying that that our moral standards are a real thing. Do you get the line of logic? <clears throat> you're either a Christian or you're living your truth. <laughs> well, yeah, or you know, it's like either there is a there is a moral, an objective moral standard, or yeah, you're, the, the person's living their truth. So sounds to me like uh, you can only be called. A hypocrite if you're a Christian. Maybe. But if you're not a Christian, you can't be a hypocrite. Can how, what are you a hypocrite about? Yeah. So the argument is always going to be heavily against the Christian because he's trying to live uh, a Christian life. Mm -hmm. Whether you call it hypocritical, semi hypocritical, or partially, or a Christian on a slippery slope. We we fall into those categories very simply by the fact that we're Christian. By the simple fact that Jesus is trying to straighten us up, or the, his, or the, the Holy Spirit is trying to justify us before we get to yeah. the New Jerusalem. And you're starting to get you're starting to get to where this whole all this is going to boil down to. In fact, I don't think I typed up a conclusion for this. Yeah, sorry, I was running late on this. But yeah, I skipped over a bunch of other stuff we may touch over after we're done with this part. So we're starting on slide forty-seven. Which would be what does what does hypocrisy point to? Yeah. And I realize those slides aren't numbered on your handouts. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're numbered. Oh, okay. there you go. It's weird. All right, so. I'm glad you put that number over there. It's going to be able to follow you better. Right. You know what? I'm going to start doing that. Thank you for the suggestion. Because that way we could. Uh, yeah. He's here. Good, good idea. I've not thought to do that before. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, as I said, this is going to be a short class because I'm skipping over a lot of the stuff I put in even after I edited everything. But. Uh, I want to make the point, what is, what is the charge of hypocrisy? What is hypocrisy even? What does it lead to? It leads to the, it leads to the premise that true Christians are most, more likely to be called hypocrites, being that the Christian moral code is incredibly high. It's an objective standard transcending the opinion of each believer. Skeptics have access to the biblical text and they can observe the daily lives of Christians, comparing the two whenever they want. It's easy to condemn the actions of those who hold to a commonly known, exceedingly high standard, and it's far more difficult to judge the lives of those who are quiet about what they believe and can later nuance their values to match their behavior. Remember changing the rules of the game after you win the game or after you play the game? Yeah. So when skeptics are angered by the obvious and consistent behavior they see in their lives, of, see in the lives of Christians, they need to examine their own lives and recognize their own more private disappointments. Christian failures are simply more available given the objectively perfect and public nature of the biblical standard. So while atheists claim that religious people are unreasonable, unscientific, 
and slavishly obedient to a system of belief, it can be seen that it's in fact these atheists themselves who irrationally adhere to their non-belief, even in the face of a clear observable evidence, sometimes even going so far as postulating fanciful hypothetical possibilities and the attempts to sidestep concrete empirical data. And you'll get this a lot. I debate atheists a ton. And oh my God, do they appeal to some crazy stuff in order to avoid obvious logic. So moreover, those who charge Christians with hypocrisy are unwittingly confirming the Christian moral code. While they may not believe it or be fully aware of Christian ethics, the mere accusation holds that the Christian moral standard is such a high standard that they would be aware of it when it is not being followed. This demonstrates an awareness of moral realism, once again the idea that moral values exist outside of persons and how it applies to Christian ethics. I think I duplicated the slides. Mm -hmm. So, a more interesting implication for those who charge Christians with hypocrisy, you agree with Jesus. As discussed previously, Jesus railed against the overt hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his day. If one can see that Christians are living to the standards that Christ condemned, one has an understanding of what moral truths are. They unwittingly are upholding a Christian ethic of human depravity. Our job is to guide them to understanding the fallen nature of humanity. Oops, what happened there? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Want to finish already? Yeah, well, so yeah, that's my main point. I don't know what, I think I was in the middle of typing, and I'm like, all right, time to go. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing is like, you can argue, like, okay, great, you call us hi hypocrites, you agree with Jesus. Why is that? Why are you point? Are, you've obviously read our Bible. You know, you know what our, our, our ethics are. Why are you pointing this out to us? And then. Any argument they have, they fall right into that dilemma. Or, like, are you going to fall back in your moral subjectivism and then claim us being hypocrites? Well, if you're going to claim us, claim that we're hypocrites, well, that's hypo hypocrisy within your own moral system. So, how can you claim for us to be hypocrites if you're not within your own moral standards? And there's even going to be a third moral standard for the world holds. So, you rarely run in these people. They're called moral nihilists. Very rare. These are really hardcore atheists. They, they tend to be kind of nice, but that believe that, okay, yeah, I know, there's we, we can have no moral standards, so there is no such thing as morality. And they will all do that, and they can't, they can't hold the, the head of the yeah. Otherwise, argument. Well, yeah, because the, the moment they start speaking of more, anything moral, they're speaking of something they don't believe that exists. So. Well, the, the, I think what they, what they go to, man, yeah, I'm please. sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Ah, please, please, please. Uh, we're actually, Pretty well done with all the slides. Well, they, they uh, whenever they make uh, that claim, in order to hold up that claim, the moral nihilist is that they they go into saying, well, what society deems appropriate or inappropriate. Yeah, that's still subjectivism, but within uh, a societal contract. Because uh, the relativists will either say it's something that morality emerges from the person, or they'll say it'll emerge from the culture. One of the two. But yeah, so they're basically. If they, they state that, then they become, they're no longer nihilists, they're moral relativists. Well, the, what I'm trying to get is, uh, cause I, and I agree, yeah. but I've seen, I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, was it Chris Hutchins? What? It was one of the four person okay. I saw in a debate. And, uh, what do? Not, I can't hold on, the, the, the other guy that, God darn it, he's really popular. Uh, talks like this. You know, uh, God darn it. Uh, oh, he's an older gentleman. Uh, okay. Uh, Peter. Uh, Peter Hitchens? No. It's, you know, Christopher Hitchens, his brother, is, is, a, is a very prominent Christian. No. no ironic, but they. So, uh, anyways, I, I could probably find a guy if I moved hard enough. All right, all right, no but anyways, worries. that's who he was debating. It was, uh, I think it was a like Cambridge. I mean, it was. Okay. Uh, but anyways, that's what he fell back on because it was over. Uh, can the atheists have morals? Uh huh. And Hitchens stated that uh, that that yes, 
He stated that a, a not he doesn't why like, he doesn't believe in it, mm -hmm. but that an atheist could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh. Yeah, Sam Harris holds to a version of utilitarianism. His highest ethic is that which, in fact, I quoted him, is that which produces the most human flourishing, which would have come out of his long sets of debates with uh, Jordan Peterson. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you're gonna, you'll have some atheists hold into uh, certain ethical systems that aren't, they're not more mindless, but there are the really hardcore ones are saying that we can't really hold any kind of moral truths. Uh, they are being about as true to their atheism as can be, but. Uh, does anybody, well, actually I'm just going to go push this out there because I was going to nerd up on all this. There are basically three ethical systems that, that the world follows. And this is one of the things I want to build up because this goes into what you're talking about. Like I'm ad lib this stuff. So we have this utilitarianism slash consequentialism, probably one of the most common. Uh, we also have legalism. So we know that from the Pharisees. Uh, that is long word for its deontological law, uh, ethics. And everything's built around rules. Everything's structured around the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bill Craig. yeah okay, Bill Craig, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill probably painted the floor with him. But, but anyways, uh, what am I saying, what am I saying? Oh yeah, so deontological, you know, basically everything is set on rules. Uh, and then the third one is called virtue ethics. That's what Christianity is built around. We live our lives in virtue of Christ's ultimate sacrifice. You know, you know, this not I uh, who live, but Christ who lives in me, and not the life I now live. I live. God, I'm, I'm, why do I forget everything when I'm in public? <sighs> who knows? But um, no, I, the life I now live, I live in the Son of for the Son who loved me and gave Himself for me. But uh, yeah, I uh, was going to say. Uh, so back to the ontological. So. I wanted to go on that legalism issue. This is something that Christians tend to fall into, the Pharisees fell into. Uh, it was an adherence to the law to the point where they worship the law over the law giver. Uh, to, to say that we have a law doesn't necessarily make us uh, legalists. It's just once we start worshiping, as, as Christ was saying, the outside of the cup, the offering on the altar rather than the altar itself. So not, not who gave these commands, but that's one of the problems with legalism. It always breaks down into exceptions. And that's exactly what happened to the Torah. You ended up with the, the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, then you ended up with everything within the Levitical Code, and then you ended up with the oral tradition, the oral law, that ended up taking every, in fact, it's still within modern Judaism, the rabbinical Judaism, you have a very big legalistic interpretation of all of the uh, Levitical code that the, say, more orthodox, actually, you wouldn't say orthodox, I can't remember the branch, would follow these days, but um, rabbinic Jews. Um, but it, legalism always breaks down into exceptions. In other words, like, you have to have a rule for every possible scenario you're going to run into in life. You know, every moral dilemma you're going to run into, you have to have a rule in order to deal with it. And if you've not run into it before, you've got to find some way to interpret that within the law, and then you end up making a new exception. And a lot of times that exception either favors you, like, not my kids, but your kids, they're breaking the law. My kids are following this new, this new exception of the rule that we just, we just came up with. So, uh, Christian virtue ethics is everything is our life is trying to live I don't know how to more simply put it. Our life is pointed, directed towards God, yes. towards Christ. Yeah, the wisdom of God. Wisdom begins with the fear of God, so that's all us directed towards. But uh, where was I going to go with this? So yeah, almost all Christian hypocrisy is birthed out of once we start dipping into either legalism or this utilitarianism. Like, well, this sin is going to produce the best good. Because you're going to run into these situations where you're going to be forced into a moral dilemma as being Christian, where you have no path but to sin. And we all know the famous saying, the less, you know, was the lesser of two sins, choose the lesser of two sins, or the lesser of two evils, should I say. Um, but that is the key moral question within every ethical system you're ever going to have is when you are presented with two bad moral cases. How do you choose? 
And if I had an answer for that, I would probably be uh, teaching in Oxford right now, <laughs> which I'm not. But that's something we're going to have to deal with is being Christians and, and being able to communicate that standard when we are in that position. So say you find out your child is homosexual. How then do you deal with it? Is it a sin to condemn them? No. Obviously, we're told to rebuke. Do we cast them out? Mm. There's biblical, um, there's biblical uh, underpinnings for that, but that will also be interpreted to the world as we're being uncaring, unloving, and bigoted, so on and so forth. And you're not demonstrating Christian love, so then how then do you handle that? So typically you're going to fall into legalism. And then the rules for thee, but not for me. And that's exactly so what Christ I, I, called I, I, out. How do you fall into legalism if you don't reject them, mm -hmm. but you say, especially if they're a Christian, mm -hmm. and you know, you say, mm -mm. Can there be such a thing as a homosexual Christian? I think so. How so? Uh, because there's many people who are blinded mm -hmm. by culture if they are not in the Word. Okay. Young people can be blinded by culture if they're not in the Word, if they've not been discipled. Okay. They will go with what culture says if they do not know what Scripture says. And I think that's where we fail our young people. Culture for their ethics? We do not disciple okay. our young Christians. You mean, do you want me to point out something to you in, in that little uh, statement you said that's very concerning as a Christian? You're assuming homosexuality is an actual real thing. It's it's like it's not a behavior trait that it's something that they may be born with, but you have to deal with that before you even say like this is culture messing with them because otherwise and I'm not blaming you for anything. This that's how in this modern day age how our language has been used that we just assume this homosexuality is almost a natural well, thing. That's what they say. Well, yeah. may, may I, we don't well, assume. But we, and we, we have to be very you, pointed and not. And assume, that's yeah. what you've got to tell your child mm -hmm. is that no, this is not biblical. Mm -hmm. This is not God's way. God does not make mistakes. God, God does not make mistakes. Yeah. He will not allow this. So there's. There's the issue of your loving, but you're also loving in truth. Mm -hmm. And then with that, it's prayer, 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 prayer. And then, you know, there have been young people who have been caught up in this, but praise God, through prayer and then through them studying, They've been delivered from it. So that's when I say, yes, they can be Christians because they've been deceived, but do they stay in it? No. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So, so then by what ethical system are we operating under there? I don't know what ethical system we're operating on is the scripture. Well, are we operating off of God's truth? By, God's virtue, truth. by virtue of God's truth, then yeah. You're, God's you're, truth. You're in virtue. But yeah, you know, this is one of the things I'm I, sorry that that seemed like a hard, harsh pushback. I think in this modern day and age, we automatically assume this concept of Christian homosexual. That is a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. You know, so, it may be, but unless you know somebody who's gone through that I have, and I watched do. the world take them away. I, I do. I, and, uh, I know people who have so gone through you, that. You but it, it, assumes, it assumes a modern, uh, modern conceptions of the person. Uh, and this is something Rachel was touching into. Uh, are we, as our identity... Our persons, are we an assemblage of our behaviors? Or is there something innate and natural to us that, that we... Because it seems like this is the, the part that the world is at. They're in this kind of weird one foot in one system, one foot in another system, in that they believe that your behavior defines who you are. If you have the desire to, or the, the predilection towards a certain set of behaviors, like in this instance, homosexuality, then you're homosexual. That is your identity. Or they're trying to seek this inner self that's true, especially this is true within gender theories, is that your true gender or your true self is somewhere, and you just need to discover it. It's inherent. It's in this odd, weird, quasi-spiritual place, but it's not 
just the, the nature of your behaviors, but then they'll go and say, okay, my, my child is acting a certain way, so I think they have this quasi-spiritual identity. But this boils down to the fact that us Christians in the modern era, we have inherited horribly the world's concept of personhood and identity. Um, within Christianity, and you were touching into this, our identity and our personhood comes from God. From Christ. Exactly. So, we can't be an assemblage of behaviors. We're not. If we are, and you're right, that indicts God for our behavior, because that may, he made our natural selves to behave that way. Could God do that? Yes. Does that go against his character? Most likely. So, um, that's something we have to be very, very careful. And like say, if I were to be, and I have done this, I, I've got family members that have those I kind of, too, so. yes. So I don't, before I can even, or sometimes at the same time of delivering the Bible, depending on where they're standing, if they're already, uh, like say, if they were, they have knowledge of the Bible, then I can go ahead and start working on that. But mo most of my family doesn't. Then I have to start dealing with, okay, what is this concept of personhood you're talking about? What is this identity that you're talking about? Where does this come from? And then be able to like, give the biblical uh, foundations for personhood, that we are image bearers of God. And we are distorted image bearers, yes, but it's not that God puts the distortions in us. They are part of our fallen nature. So that's all I want to go with that. But you see where I, this is something that I'm going to try to train you all is to listen to these subtle hints and clues you hear from people talking, the language that they have, because we've so adopted all of this due to the movies we watch, our family speaking these, these ways, that you're going to want to be sensitive towards it. So, uh, may I, please, according to scripture, um, there just the reason I, First Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses twelve. I'm only going to read verses twelve through, okay. to nineteen or eighteen. Go ahead. It says, uh, "All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord." And the Lord for the body, and God raised the God raised the Lord, and will also raise raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of, of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with Him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Okay, go back to the first, yeah, thank you, that's very powerful, very poignant, the conversation. Go back to the first few lines you were reading. There is one key word in this that you that you want to look out for here. Um, the first two verses? Yeah. Or, okay. um, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, okay. and the stomach for food. Okay. And God will destroy both one and the other. There's one word in there that no longer makes sense to the world. Dominated? Nope. It seems so benign that it doesn't even stick out to us anymore. Meant. That God meant things to be a certain way. God created us for certain purposes. That God meant or a man and a woman to join as one flesh mm -hmm. in the way that God meant. Intent. Exactly. It's a concept called teleology that there are, there, God, you don't have to necessarily be a Christian to believe in a teleological meaning, but it means that there's an ultimate end or a goal or a purpose. And that's the key word. A purpose in everything in the world, especially and most especially within persons. And within our identities too, that they are meant for a specific purpose, they are meant for a specific function, and they're meant for a specific end. But 
the world no longer recognizes that concept anymore. We are just assemblages of atoms. We are merely on the mission to propagate our genes and nothing more. So how then can we have a purpose in our lives? Well, it seems like in the absence that we are trying to find that purpose in whatever way we can, and each one of those ways that we can just happens to be something that takes us and distorts us further and further from the image of God as he intended and implanted in each one of us. So, little yeah. subtle words that mean the world. That's yeah. something we need to be on the lookout for. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. May also, uh, we, you're in five, just the first eight verses on that. Because mm -hmm. okay. this, this, this also pertains. It says, it is actually reported that there is sexually immora sexual immorality among you, mm -hmm. and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as at present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to, to deliver this man to Satan for destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know a little lump, a little leaven, leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I'm going to go further. It says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all. Meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swimmers or idolaters, since they would be, since they would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, revival, drunkard, swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what I for what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom you are you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. And so so I would say that if you had a child, if you had a, 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 a child that was pronouncing rebellion against God and stating that they identify as homosexual to uh, um, get them out of your house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, they're, if they're living with someone they're not married to. Yeah, well, well, that's sexually immoral. Yeah, so I think that's my whole point, well, you know, is we as Christians tend to have that scale of sexual immorality no. rather than just saying all of these things are sexual immorality. Well, I would say that would probably even be extended to uh, to uh, not just not just the sexual. Uh, if you have uh, uh, someone among you that that's probably addicted to porn or or something of that nature, that would all be sexual mm -hmm. sexual morality. Yeah, I've seen so pastors uh, removed from their positions for that very purpose before. Yeah. So, so yeah, that would be hypocritical. I mean, yeah. very yeah. easy mm -hmm. mistake yeah. that we have someone yeah. that is that is proclaiming mm -hmm. to be brother, and he is guilty. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is dealing specifically with a hypocrite. Exactly. So it is hypocritical for us to turn our back on them. We we have definite uh, instructions on how to rebuke those. Mm -hmm. And that's it. We 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 know we're given the instructions on how to rebuke. Yes. And and how to confront someone, whether it's our teenagers that are having sex in high school or junior high, or whether it's adult children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews. We have that instruction. And it, it's not to bury our head in the sand and say, oh, well, it's just the way society is. But I, that, that's us being that more it just religious. seems like a lot of times as Christians, we will, like I said, have that scale mm -hmm. of, oh, well, this is okay, but I'd be horrified if my child did this. Yeah. When it's just like what Farrell read, it's all of it. Yes. So I think that we can be called out as hypocrites is when we try to put sins on the scale. 
And I think that's how we end up getting the pastors with pornography because it's like, oh, well, that's in my own privacy. I'm not hurting anybody. Well, Scripture clearly says that you are hurting yourself. You are hurting and also that temple of God. Destroying society. And, if we know, don't and you're destroying your family. Yeah, we, we, well, and you're propagating the, the sex trade. Yes, uh, within, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's no such thing as sin in isolation. But yeah, that falls back to the same dilemma. If a Christian is going to make that kind of uh, exception, dispensation, they have now delved in the realm of moral subjectivism. Yeah, I would, I would also have to state, though, that this looks like what would happen. Um, now, we're, we're not to have anything to do with the sexually immoral out the world. For instance, we would not attend a drag show. Right. Or, or anything of that nature. Like or we, and, we did, and we wouldn't, and of course, we wouldn't go down Main Street to, to uh, you know, wait at night to proselyte hookers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, uh, prostitutes. Sorry. Both the same. But, um, but uh, it seems like this isn't dealing with your children. This is dealing with uh, people in the church proclaiming to be Christian and who are not. Mm -hmm. um, if someone who is identifying, if, if your identity is something in, other than Christ, then you probably never redeemed to begin yeah. with. And that's that's the biggest thing too. So like if you're if you're a moral subjectivist and a Christian you're making those kind of exceptions, you then by by proxy you're not a Christian. You are to but you are to you are to evangelize your children. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that someone who has a homosexual child shouldn't be in, a, or sexually immoral child, shouldn't be in a leadership position. I mean, that is one yeah, of the I standards. That, I see second, that's also, true. Yeah, second, that's first Timothy, the third chapter, the the mm -hmm. the, the uh, qualifications for mm -hmm. elder. Yeah. So that would definitely disqualify them from that. But um, I wouldn't say I, I I don't depending on the age of the child. Now, if we're talking to somebody who's 18, who's being rebellious, they're lucky we're not living under the law because they would be stoned. <laughs> They'd be stoned to death. But, um, but uh, we're living under grace. Uh, depending on the age of the child, I would say you have to provide, you have to protect, you have to evangelize your child. You know, you send them to, you send them to Caesar's school, they're going to come back Romans. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, they're, they're influenced by the culture more than they are influenced by the home, your first act as leader of your home is to evangelize your home. Yeah, and I think that's that exactly yeah. right. And I, I think a lot, and I think some of us that are I'm sort of older, we might, people our age, I think in some cases, left the church to disciple our children. Okay, what I was going to say. And that realize <laughs> that. The church is not the place that children are to be discipled. It is, it is an add-on. It is a support. But just like your family, the homeschooling and your mom discipling you and your dad day in, day out, day in, day out, that's where it begins, is the discipleship in your home. Because if you leave it to the church, and it was good to help both, though, because mm -hmm. um, if it's just the family, you end up with weirdos. I got it. <laughs> yeah, but I agree. I agree. The, the discipleship does. The, 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 the head of the family should be the, the head of the discipleship of the family. But then the, the head of the family also then is submissive to the, the elders of the church and the elders of the it's church submissive are submissive to God. Exactly. So. Submissive to God. <laughs> but you, the elder of the family is abrogating their duty the moment they they hand it off to anybody else to do it. And then they're no longer being submissive to their wife. Well, actually, I'm sorry, not submissive. No, excuse me. They're not being, they're not serving. They're, 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 well, they're not being, they're not serving their family in the way that they should be. They're not, they're not being the head of the family. They're not demonstrating uh, Christ's sacrificial love for their family and that they just don't care to do they want somebody else to take care of that but yeah it's it's it is the foundation of why we have slid away as as a culture because we as with everything else have thought it's somebody else's job to do we outsource and that in a sense makes us a hypocrite it, yeah it is but not in a sense it does it does make us a hypocrite yes. <laughs> It does. I think any time that we go against the teachings of Christ or the teachings of the teachings here, 
when we go against it and go our own way, like he did, we are a hypocrite. Well, you know what? Even when you do it in your mind, and yes. it's not and it's not outward, you're a but hypocrite. In your mind. Yeah. But the the mark of a the mark of a true Christian, we find that in Romans twelve. Um, Romans 12, starting in the ninth, ninth verse, is called, it talks about the marks of a true Christian. But um, look, the one thing I think that, that, that separate, like I wouldn't classify Christians as sinners saved by grace. I would say we're repenters of sin who have been saved by grace. We're, we're no longer sinners, guys. Yeah, we are now, we're, so, so um, although, I mean, that's something that, that's popular. I just wouldn't classify myself as that way. Um, but, Whenever you, the one thing that separates us from from people who are not true Christians, would be the the absolute inherent need for repentance. Once we have done something that violates the commandments of God, would you say that would be an awareness of our own hypocrisy? Absolutely, I think God makes us aware, and not only that, but um, if you continue in it, if you're a true Christian, God will chastise you, yes. and we're to and we're to love the Lord's discipline. Yes. Because those he loves, he will so, discipline. So if you had, so, and, and to go even further, if you had a child whom, whom you have, whom you have seen, they could be prodigal. I mean, there's such a thing as, as, as people uh, who are saved that, that end up uh, kind of, you know, wandering off the path. And I wouldn't say that they are turned over, you know, uh, this is this guy in, in 1 Corinthians 6 or 5. Where um, Paul, yeah, that, that Paul put away, basically kicked out of the church. He did it so that basically this guy turned him over to Satan so that his flesh could be burned up, that his spirit could be saved. Mm -hmm. um, he later came back. That same guy later came back. I, I'm not sure if it's first or second Corinthians, but he and later sometimes came Sometimes that discipline. And sometimes it's pretty harsh discipline is what brings them back. So, what's, the so, what's, what's, what's the core? What's the core of the word discipline? Disciple. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that discipline will bring them back. Okay. And that's, well, the same thing happens with a with a hypocrite. Same mm -hmm. thing happens with this guy. We uh. Even when we, even when we wonder, the Lord has a way of, of bringing us back, whether it's through. Um, discipline, chastisement, loss, these things. Uh, the, the, when did God start bringing back the prodigal son? You know, whenever he, basically whenever he started, he was like, he was right there at the big trial. Mm -hmm. And he was like, man, I can get I can serve at my father's house and get treated better than this. So, well, one of the things I wanted to address, and I think I'm going to close down the, the live stream after this, is uh, in regards to, like, say, what, um, this idea of this spectrum or the scale of sin is it all starts with the same justification and it starts with what rationalized the very first sin. Mm -hmm. What did God really say? Right. And is this an exception to God's rule? When we do that very, very same deception mm -hmm. that Satan did in the garden. So that makes us just as culpable as Satan at that point. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray us out, so we can uh, I'm going to shut down the live stream, but uh, really enjoy the discussion. I'm not going to say we're stopping this discussion by any means. I'm just going to stop the live stream. So, most gracious Heavenly Father, we lift your name on high. We thank you today to be able to come together to learn, first, of your example in calling out hypocrites in the world, starting in our own heart, but also how to counter this charge that we are levied against so that we're able to present your gospel to the world, Lord. Be able to highlight and shine your light upon people's sins in order that they may come to know you, Lord. We pray that you'll give us the wisdom in the days to come to be able to minister to our friends, our families, our loved ones, and our community that we may be able to Teach your truth, Lord, and your holy word to this world that is in so dire need of it, Lord. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.